Hey, good morning, One Hope. Welcome to another online Sunday. For the last two weeks, we've been speaking about the true story and returning to this true story. Last week, just so beautiful to listen to Tim Mackey and how he was explaining how there's an earth and a heaven and how God has intended for these to come back together and what Jesus means in terms of that and what hell looks like and how, how we figure that out in the whole mix. But what I really want to speak about this morning is how does the true story influence or impact on our faith? Like in the way that we actually practically live out our faith before God on a day-by-day basis as those who belong to Jesus and who say that we follow Him, what does it look like to work out our faith? And so this morning, if you are, are watching in and you're someone who doesn't yet know what you believe and maybe you're exploring Christianity, I just want to apologize right up front that in some way, this is a, a bit of a family message. It's a message where we are asking as people who follow Christ, how do we do this well? But I don't want you to check out because there's so much here that is going to be valuable for you and it's going to help you understand who God is and what the true story is that he speaks um, through his through his word the Bible and so we're going to start off this morning we're actually going to have quite a lot of discussion this morning but what we're going to do is that we're going to in our groups I'm going to ask you to stop and to just discuss among yourselves this one question what has most grown your faith what is it? Just, just throw out a few ideas. It doesn't have to just be one thing, just a bunch of things. What is it that's grown your faith? And just answer that one question. And so as we come back from those discussions, there's five categories that I want to suggest that pretty much everything that you shared in your group would fit into one of these five areas. I'm going to call them five faith catalysts. They're things that have springboarded our faith or things that have really tremendously grown us as we've done them over time. And they're quite simple. The first one is purposeful relationships. So many people tell stories of others who've grown their faith. Whether it's someone that mentored you, a mom, a dad, a friend, or maybe it's even you caring for someone else. But it's a a purposeful, meaningful relationship that tremendously grows your faith. The second thing that many people would reference is the preached word of God. Especially when it's practically preached. The preached prophetic preaching of God's word. Word And so this would grow you think about you say, well, I've listened to this sermon or I I, I heard this or I had a discussion with a friend from God's word. And as James says, the word of God was held up as a mirror and you saw yourself and you were like, oh, my goodness, this needs to change. And so there's a moment where you have a revelation and it's a huge growth in your faith journey. That's practical, prophetic preaching. The third one is personal habits of grace. Many of you would know this as personal disciplines. It's reading God's word. It's prayer. It's seeking silence and solitude. It's meditation, which is actually a scriptural idea and has always been a scriptural idea. So that's personal habits of grace, like these things that we do over time that really grow our faith. The fourth one is practical serving. It's opportunities that we've had that we've said yes to. It might be a mission trip. It might be serving on a music team. It might be serving in a school. It might be serving with a serve Stellenbosch partner. Whatever it is, there's been these moments in our lives where we look back and we say, that experience, I didn't feel ready for it or it surprised me, but that tremendously grew my faith. And then the last one, I think many of you in your groups would have referenced this, is pivotal circumstances. Something happened in your life. And that could be something really tragic, the death of a loved one, a really difficult experience, your business going bankrupt, or it could be something really positive. It could be that you got a job that you just didn't think you would ever get, or you were able to study and you were able to study further than what you ever imagined you could have. And you had opportunities that were given to you through bursaries or whatever it might be. And so these are pivotal circumstances, kind of big block moments that we look back on our lives and say, wow, that thing changed my life and changed and grew my faith. And so we thank God for these things that have already grown our faith. But I want to ask us this morning, how do we how do we harness these things to grow our faith even more? Or if you're just starting out in your faith, how do you understand these things and grow in them so that God can use them to grow our faith? And ultimately these five things 
are designed by God for us to flourish. It's for us to know Him more, to live more pleasure-filled, satisfied, meaningful, purposeful lives. That's the point of living fully human. But with each of these things, there's a true story and there's a false story. And the, the true story is what God says and what God teaches. And then there's a false story, which is where we're getting from wherever, from the world, from culture, from conventional wisdom. It might be from your family. It might be from your friends. It might be from Hollywood. It might be from a news outlet. It might even be from the Heiskanut. But somewhere we are drawing information on what our lives are supposed to look like and how we're supposed to live our lives. And either we're living in the false story or we're living in the true story. Now I'm going to use this morning the first one, purposeful relationships, as an example to show you what I mean by the false story and the true story and how this plays out in each of these five faith catalyst areas that you've been discussing. And then in your groups, you're going to discuss the next four of them, right? So I'm just going to do the first one, purposeful relationships. Here's the fact. Fact one, relationships are broken. I don't think I need to convince you of this. We look around our world, everywhere we look, broken relationship, divorce, business partners, whatever it may be, broken relationships. Fact two, is that God didn't design it this way. This was not God's intent for us to Him or from us to one another. This is not God's plan. Remember Genesis chapter 3. Effectively what happens in Genesis 1, 2 and 3 that we looked at two weeks ago is Adam and Eve are put into this purpose-filled relationship with God. It's beautiful. He comes and walks in the cool of the day in the garden with them. But they choose against God. They say, God, we don't trust you. We're going to follow the serpent. We're going to self-determine. We're going to follow our own way. And then immediately God... God comes and says, where are you? And he, he wants to reestablish relationship with them. What have you done? And God begins already to set in motion a plan for redemption, for a, in a, in a sense, return to Eden, in a, in a return to the world where heaven and earth were not separated by sin, but where we could walk with God in the cool of the day. And so we just like Adam and Eve have completely messed up, but God shows us clearly that He wants relationship with us. So what's the true story of the Bible? The true story is that we were created to be dependent. We were created to be dependent firstly on God, secondly on one another. We we're supposed to have relationships that flourish and that are life-giving and joy-filled and, and full of wholeness and not the brokenness that we live in. We're, we're meant to live in beautiful harmony with God and with one another. We went meant to walk with God in the cool of the day. And that's a, a metaphor for also how we're supposed to live with people. Where we're supposed to have flourishing, joy-giving, life-giving relationships. That's the true story. The false story, and you'll see this at work in, in your life and in the lives of so many around you, is that we don't need anybody else. Introducing anybody else into the story just brings pain, just brings brokenness, just brings hurt. And so like Adam and Eve, we're going to go and find our bush. We're going to go and hide in that bush and we're going to hide away from other relationships. Maybe we keep our family close and a few uh, precious BFFs and we keep them very close. But everybody else is kind of like us against the world. And if we don't need personal relationships, then we especially, for some people, we say, well, I don't need a relationship with God. Thank you very much. If he even exists. And so this is the, the false story. And we see this perpetuated right all around Stellenbosch. I still, I've been here seven years. I still can't believe how many people professing Christ following people. And I, they are sincere Christ followers, but who don't belong to any local church. And their reason most often is I've been hurt. And I understand that. And I believe them because I've been hurt too. I really have. It's been hurtful being part of local, local congregations in my life. And yet, still we can see that the true story of God is that the answer is not to step out of local church. That's the false story. The God way, the true story is reconciliation and healing. And is it easy? No, because we're all broken and we're all sinful. And just like I've been hurt, so have I hurt others in the churches that I've been 
a part of. But I think we could all agree that dependence is not a popular word in the year 2021. And there's a myriad of reasons, a false story reasons why we would avoid purposeful relationships. But what is the true story? What is the true story that the Bible speaks about God and our relationship with Him and our relationship with others? Now let me point you to a phrase that first occurs in the book of Genesis in chapter 17. And what's happening is that God is making a covenant with Abraham. It's actually Abram at the start of the story and he's Abraham at the end of the story. But what's happening there is that Adam and Eve have sinned. They've fallen away from God. They've chosen their own path. That's the fall, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And then God begins to restore relationship with them. But mankind continues to choose against God. Cain kills Abel. Um, we see all this, this perpetual wickedness until the time of Noah, where it's so wicked, it's so terrible that God decides to destroy the whole world and to just keep for himself a little remnant, one family, Noah's family. But it's not long and we see that Noah's family are also falling away and are also broken and they continue to perpetuate sin. And so God then calls out for himself a man called Abram. And Abram, God makes this covenant with him in Genesis 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. You can go and read those chapters. In chapter 17, God is with him and it says, Abram fell on his face and God said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And the, the name, the name Abraham actually means father of a multitude. And then God's promises about Israel and about the, the, the line, the sons and the daughters who are going to come from Abraham. This, this promise, this covenant that God is making would be for them too. And then God gives this beautiful promise. I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. And this is now God's redemption plan. This is the one of the big stories of the Bible that God wants to restore Eden to us, that he's going to be our God and we're going to be his people. But it doesn't stop there in Genesis chapter 17. If we go and we read in 2 Corinthians in chapter 6, and I want to use this reference because it shows us this continuing story in the New Testament. We go and we read, and, and the author here, Paul, is actually speaking to New Testament believers, believers in Jesus Christ, but he's reaching back into Leviticus chapter 26. And this is a quote, but Paul says to them, For we are the temple of the living God. You Christians in Corinth, you are the temples of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. Just listen to the language. I'm going to walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is the promise of God. And then we go right to the end of the Bible. And guys, there's about 50 references that I can find with an almost exact phrase. I will be your God. You will be my people. I will walk with you. We will talk together. We will have communion together. This kind of language is like it's on repeat from Genesis right the way through. And then we get to Revelation chapter 21. And literally the second to last um, chapter of the Bible describes what Tim Mackey was doing so beautifully in the sermon last week, where it was heaven and earth being reunited back to Eden, but in a brand new way with a, with a city that comes down from heaven. And it's this new Eden. It's this, this redeemed place where man and God can truly be together again. And this is what Revelation 21 says. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, what is God going to declare as this new city comes down from heaven, this new Jerusalem, and we get to live in it, those who follow Jesus? What does he say? Finally, he says, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Where Genesis and Jeremiah and Isaiah and the Psalms and Corinthians and so many other texts have been pointing forward and saying, there's a time coming. There's a new Eden coming. There's a new city coming. God is speaking a true story over the world. Revelation 21 is the culmination of that. It's it actually happening. And it carries on and says, he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. 
And so the true story is that God has always and forever designed us to be in purposeful relationship with himself. Do you get it start to finish? The Bible is the Bible story is speaking about how God is taking a people for himself to dwell with them, to live with them, to walk with them and the results are so incredible. When you carry on reading Revelation 21, you'll see that it says there's no more crying. There's no more hurt. There's no more death. There's no more tears. There's no more mourning. There's no more pain. And then this little verse says, because all these former things have passed away. Sin has been dealt with. Guys, this is not only something that we do in heaven one day in Revelation 21. It's something that we now Now, through Christ Jesus, we get to answer God's question where God comes to me and asks the Genesis 3 question, Paul, where are you? Why are you hiding? What have you done? In confidence because of Jesus Christ, because of what Christ has done, I'm able to answer, here I am, Lord. I'm not hiding in the bush anymore. It's me, God. I'm here in my, in my filthy, in my filthy, sinful state, but covered by the blood of Jesus. I'm able to stand confident, as we spoke about in our prayer series from Hebrews 4. Let us then enter boldly into the throne room of grace because we have a high priest who knows our weakness, who sympathizes with our weakness, right? And so I can come and confidently say, here I am, Lord, use me for your purposes. Grow my faith. Teach me. I want to be used of you, God. Isn't that such an incredibly different picture to religion? Isn't it such an incredibly different picture to trying to earn my way toward God? Doesn't it help when I start thinking about personal habits of grace and why I read my Bible and why I pray and why I find a place of silence and solitude to just be alone a little bit with God in the midst of a crazy, busy life? Or why I would do the craziness of fasting and denying my body food, which is crazy. Why would I do these things? Because it's not some religious duty. It's because I have understood the story story of the Bible that God wants to dwell with me now and he's creating it even more perfectly in the future that I'm going to be a part of. Man, I want as much of that as I can get right now. And I'm going to read my word because it teaches me. I'm going to pray because then I'm with my father. I'm close to him. He's speaking to me. I'm speaking to him. It's glorious and it's precious. What about our relationship with one another how does this outwork purposeful relationships but the truth of God's word is that when you come to Christ you don't come to Christ only it's not an individual like this is just me and God like just no one else matters nothing else matters here it's just me and Jesus that's not a scriptural idea at all what's actually happening in a true salvation moment where someone is saying yes to Jesus they're actually also saying yes to the church of Jesus. Capital C, the global church, those who have lived thousands of years ago and and put their faith in God and put their faith in Jesus, we're saying yes to that church. I love in the book of Acts when it speaks about Peter standing up on the day of Pentecost and he delivers this sermon and then it says 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is what happens. We get added. You can't have a personal, private, individualistic type Christianity and marry it up with the word of God and think that that's okay. It's not. Maybe the the most simple and the most helpful way I can help you to see this is to simply look at the one another commands of the New Testament. This is every time in the New Testament that the phrase one another, which is a community phrase, right? You can't do one another by yourself. You can't do it alone. And so these one another phrases occur more than a hundred times in the New Testament. And 47 of them are unique instructions. And so there's instructions here around unity, like accept one another. Don't bite, devour and consume one another. Gently, patiently tolerate one another. How much we need to hear this in in our COVID world right now where everyone's sprouting an opinion and telling everyone how dumb they are around the position that they've taken around the vaccines or around COVID or around wearing masks. Scripture says gently, patiently tolerate one another or love one another through love. Serve one another is Galatians 5.13. Be devoted to one another in love. 
is Romans 12 verse 10. And it's just, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at these 100 occurrences in the New Testament and go, oh, I can only do these things meaningfully if I'm plugged into a local gospel community. That's inescapable. And so the false story here is I'll do this on my own. The false story is I don't need others and they don't need me because it's not just about you needing them. They actually need you as part of that community. And everyone who doesn't form part of a, of a community and believes the false lie of the devil that they can just do Christianity, they're on the side by themselves. Everyone who does that is actually impoverishing the body of Christ. And so the true story is that being meaningfully part of a committed gospel community is God's idea of what is good for me. The big idea from this whole section of purposeful relationships is that God uses other people to grow my faith. And the flip side of that is that God wants to use you and God wants to use me to grow other people's faith. This is an outward focused and an inward focused and a upward focused to God thing. It's all of these things. That's how I want to frame purposeful relationships. I'm going to pass back to your groups and I'm going to ask you, you can talk about this one, number one, purposeful relationships, but mostly focus your time on number two, three, four, and five. So what is the false story that we believe around the preached word of God? What is the false story we believe around personal disciplines or habits of grace? What are the false stories we believe around pivotal circumstances or practical serving? And then I want us in our groups to talk through what it is that the true story is. What has God said? What has God spoken through his word? What is the true story over these faith catalysts in our lives? All right, and so as we come back from that, let me just go through those four things super quickly to just, just outline a few false story, true story scenarios. So when we speak about preaching, some of the false stories, we don't need an authority. We have no authority. We are our own authority. We are our own truth. We will self-determine and God's word comes and says, no, 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 I am the authority. God is the authority. God's words that he's spoken through the Bible, these are the authority and God has created us to live and to flourish and to thrive under his authority. And the big idea is that God uses his preached word to grow our faith. What about personal habits of grace? Well, the false story is that I have to do these things to be accepted by God. The false story is that I've got to prove to God that I'm worthy by having my quiet time, by reading my Bible, by praying. I've got to go to the prayer meeting and, and sound very religious and God needs certain language. The, the false story is that the Bible's so confusing and it's, it's for those who've studied theology. That's a lie. It's the false story. The false story is that when I pray, God doesn't hear me. The true story is that I'm loved and I'm in a relationship with a father who wants to reveal himself to me. He wrote his word so that I can understand it. He wants me to pray because he's listening and because he changes things as I pray with faith in my heart. Some of us need a pastoral moment right here. Some of us are bringing our lens of earthly moms and dads or earthly broken relationships, or maybe you've been divorced, or maybe you're still married, but it's a horrible marriage. And so you're taking your husband or your wife, and, and they the lens that you're applying to God. And so as you talk to them, and you see this blank expression across their face, or they just get their phone, and they just ignore you, or whatever it may be, and that pain from a parent, or pain from someone that you love, begins to taint your lens of God. And so you think, God, when I pray, you like a distracted parent. you like a, an unloving spouse or whatever it may be and we've got to come and we've got to turn this lens and say father would you renew my mind to show me that you are not like this that you actually love me that you actually care for me that you actually want to hear me that this relationship is the most precious relationship I can ever have that it's so beautiful the big idea is that God uses personal habits of grace 
to grow our faith? What about practical serving? Well, the false story is really clearly I am the center of the universe. You must serve me. Now, we use far more sophisticated language to say that. But if you audit it and you get to the nuts and bolts, effectively what we're saying is I am the center of the universe. And if we look at it in the leadership lens, then the leadership lens is I, I want to dominate people. That's what leadership is. I'm going to have power. I want to dominate. That's the, the false story. The true, the true story is Jesus coming and saying, I am the servant of all. I came to serve people, not to be served. Follow me. The true story is you're not the center of the universe. God is the center of the universe. And God says to us that our lives are most fulfilled when we serve others. We have most purpose in our lives when we are taken out of the center. God is put in the center and God teaches us to serve others and we flourish. This is the, the crazy part. So the big idea is that God uses what we say yes to. The things that we say, yes, I'm going to serve others and I'm going to do this and I'm going to, I'm going to pay the price to go on a mission and take my personal uh, leave from work and pay finance to go and serve others with the good news of Jesus. That is growing to our faith. Or when I'm going to, I'm a, I'm a businessman or a businesswoman or, or someone who, who, who might in the eyes of the world appear quite important, but I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to go and set out chairs on a Sunday morning or, or stand in a band and play or make time for someone that I know needs time, even though they're like, they're not in a worldly sense in my rank. I'm going to take time to go and be with them. This is serving that grows our faith. And the last one is pivotal circumstances. And I know you've been talking about this, and I think there'd be a lot of examples in our groups of the false story in, in this section. But some that just sprung to mind for me is, is obvious, an obvious one when suffering happens, when we go bankrupt, or when someone that we love dies, or something terrible happens in our lives. And the false story is that God doesn't care for you. God doesn't care for your family. He doesn't love you. He doesn't care that that person has died. The true story is Romans 8.28. That God is working all things to the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. It's that God loves you. And, and the true story crosses over into success as well. And successful pivotal circumstances. And you become a success and you make loads of money. Or you have a position of power. Or you have a career move that you could never have engineered. And you find yourself in a job where you're just like, like Esther in the king's court. And you're just like, oh my goodness, I could never have got here on my own. And it's an incredible pivotal circumstance in your life. And uh, the false story is this is because of me. This is because I'm so great. It's because of my hard work. It's because of my choices. It's because I've leveraged all these things. The true story is what the Bible teaches is that everything good that we have comes from God's hands. God has given us those things. It's not to do with our greatness. And so we learn to give it away as God's pattern is our time, our talents, our treasure. We're saying, I'm not just going to build my own little empire with this thing. I'm going to build God's kingdom. We, we learn generosity. We learn humility. And so the big idea out of this section is that God uses life circumstances to grow our faith. Now, let me close by reminding us why. Why? Well, God created us. So he knows us. Back to Genesis 1. God holds the user manual to our lives. But God doesn't just know us and hold the user manual. He wants us to flourish. He wants us to live satisfied, fulfilled, purposeful, meaningful, finding the truth kind of lives. Guys, this is foreign to our Christian ears. We've been told pleasures, fulfillment, satisfaction. You've got to deny all these things so that you can follow Christ. It's not true. He's created these desires in us. We're supposed to pursue pleasure. We're supposed to pursue fulfillment and satisfaction and purpose and meaning. We're just looking in all the wrong places. We're supposed to find them in God and in His pattern for our lives, in relationship with Him, in serving others, and all these things. We're talking about these things. I want you to, I want you to imagine with me for a moment a community that functioned according to the pattern of God's Word. 
I want you to think about a community where people love each other so much that they are in relationship, costly relationship with one another, where they're trying to keep peace, where they're trying to love each other and serve each other and obey these one another commands, all the while that they're in this relationship with God that is sweet and beautiful and life-giving and free from religion and free from all the junk of moralism and behaviorism and trying to tick all the boxes. Can you imagine what that community would look like? Can you imagine that you add into that community this, this beautiful preached Word of God accurately, regularly, sitting under the Word of God, not one in four Sundays, but regularly saying, I want to let the Word of God speak into my life. I don't understand it. I want to understand it. I need more. I need more. I need more. Can you imagine what this community would look like as each of those people began to take seriously the pattern of God around coming to God in prayer? Understanding God through the reading of His Word. Taking time out to reset in silence and solitude. Fasting together. And these disciplines that the Bible speaks about. These habits of grace. Can you imagine what a community looked like where we thought about how we could serve one another and serve people far away and people close by and people in less fortunate situations. Can you imagine how we would go through suffering together. Giving glory to God. Understanding this big picture. Could you imagine what our successes would look like as instead of hoarding for ourselves, we said, these are my talents. I want to give them to God. I want to give them to his church. I want to give them away to people in Stellenbosch and those around me. This is my treasure. I don't want to store it in a field and dig a big hole so it's just for me and my family. I want to give it away. I want to laugh at money. I want to bless people all around me. And we just we're just looking for ways to give away our treasure. And we take our time and we say, man, I don't want to live a job where I can't do anything for God's kingdom. No, I'm going to reject that false lie. And I'm going to say, Lord, my time is yours. Tell me how to use it. Tell me who you want to spend it with. Tell me what kind of job I need to do. Show me the, the boundaries maybe that I need to put in place with my job. You see, this is a call to flourishing. This is a call to living fully human. It's not a call to monkish living. It's not a call to, to moralism. I mean, think just think about, think as an example about how this works with parenting, right? In some way, shape or form, you've had a parent or parents or, or adoptive parents or someone that has played a parental role in your life, right? And so now think about saying to a child, don't do that. God doesn't like that. Stop that. Jesus won't let you into heaven. Don't do that. Jesus is going to be so angry with you and he's going to hit you with a big stick. Imagine the difference of, of, from that that many of us grew up under, right? This behavior, moralism type understanding. And often it would be a lot more subtle than that, but we, we're getting the same message across. Imagine the difference of being able to say to your children, do you know that Jesus designed us to flourish? Do you know that Jesus designed us to have the most pleasure-filled, fulfilled, meaningful life that we could ever have? And do you know that he gave us a pattern to do that? Do you know that he gave us a way that we could actually live these joy-filled, beautiful lives? And what you're doing right now, the bickering that you're doing, it might seem like it's really small. But what's going to happen is that if we, don't, if we don't look at that and ask the question around the pattern that God's done versus the pattern that we're trying to do as a family, that thing's going to grow. And in 20 years' time, we're not even going to want to be at our family reunion, Right? Because there's such a gap that's grown between us from bickering and, and, and not following God's plan. And we're going to reap the rewards of, of that. Don't we want to rather look at God's plan for a satisfied, fulfilled life? Isn't it such a different lens on why we don't bicker? Or why we don't do this? Or why we don't do that? And so when we look at these five faith catalysts, these are God's gift to us, given to us for our flourishing. This is God's answer to the question, where are you? He says, I've provided Jesus so that you could come to me. And these are some of the ways, these five catalysts are beautiful gifts that God have given us, has given us to help us walk closely with him to re-establish relationship with him. He's saying, I'm your creator. I'm your designer. I know what you need. And really the question under all the questions is trust. Do you trust me? Are you going to follow the pattern that you think is the pattern? Or are you going to follow the pattern that I say is the pattern? Are you going to follow the false story? Or are you going to follow 
the true story. And that's an issue of trust. If we're saying, God, I trust you, I want to follow you, then we turn to his word. Then we turn to those around us. Then we turn to practical prophetic preaching. Then we face our circumstances differently. Then we turn to personal disciplines and we say, God, I need to know what your pattern looks like. Let me finish off by talking about Jesus. How did Jesus, when you look at these five things, how did he do with purposeful relationships and his connection with the Father? What does he say? I only do what I see my Father doing. Completely submitted to the relationship with his Father. Completely under the authority of the Father. I look at Jesus and the Word of God and how He knew it and how He taught it to others and how He explained it to others, completely understanding the Word of God. But I I also look at it in in the false story and how the devil came and used God's own words to tempt Jesus. And yet Jesus identifies it as a false story and He says, that's not true. This is what Scripture actually says. And the devil was using Scripture itself to try and twist Jesus and Jesus has to use scripture to say no you haven't understood it can we look for a better example of servant leadership guys this is the greatest moment of service ever recorded that Jesus the son of God who had no fault who had no sin, says, I am going to, in a servant way, I'm going to serve mankind by dying for them, by giving my own blood for them. It's the greatest act of service we could ever try and comprehend. What about personal habits of grace? You read the Gospels and we see Jesus frequently taking himself away to pray, frequently reading from the scroll or reading, or he knew the scriptures. It was so obvious how much he had read them because he knew them. He just could recite them in any way or any time. And we see Jesus in in a beautiful examples of personal habits of grace. And then we see Jesus ready for the most pivotal circumstance that ever could be the cross. The most awful, wonderful, paradoxical thing that's ever happened. And Jesus, in his pivotal moment, says to the Father, Not my will, but yours. Servant-hearted, not my will, but yours. For the sake of Adam and Eve and their descendants and you and I. So that these two worlds, which are separate, heaven and earth, God and man, true story and false story, so that once again they can come together and be one And we can have man and God dwelling together in a beautiful return to Eden. Revelation 21. And pray for us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for what you've stirred in our hearts. Thank you for the discussions in our groups. Thank you for the time that's been given to thinking through the false story and the true story. And I ask you, Lord, that these things would work and change our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.